Okay, so we're going to kind of mainly focus on vision. This is true of the field in general. Uh, vision is our most important sense. It's what we rely on the most. Um, uh, the eyes are the windows on the soul. You don't really say, you know, the nose is the window onto the soul. Haven't heard that one. Nope. Uh, so really, we, we rely on vision so much. So here is a diagram kind of top down looking at, at how uh, optic rays coming from different places in our visual field out there. Uh, then come in and go through the lenses in our eyes and get focused onto this part of the back part of the eyeball uh, where the retina is. And so there's all sorts of other stuff about the lenses and the other kind of gross stuff in the eyeballs, but I'm not going to talk about that because it grosses me out. Um, so that just from terms of terminology, you have the nasal part, which is the middle part of the visual field, and then the temporal is the kind of lateral part of the temporal field near your temples. Um, and so uh, you actually get different parts of those visual signals going, uh, receiving from the right versus the left visual field. You can see that in, in terms of these rays that come in. And interestingly, after things get uh, detected and transduced and turned into these nerve signals in the retina through those rods and cones, we'll talk more about that in a second, uh, they then kind of go back into uh, this uh, pathway into the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And on their way, you get this critical kind of remixing so that your left visual field, which comes in through the two different eyes, right, um, gets kind of remixed and separated so that you have a clear, uh, consistent representation of all of your left visual field, integrating the vision from both eyes, going into your right hemisphere. OK, and then the right visual field, again, gets mixed and put in and routed into your left hemisphere. And this is a characteristic of the brain. We didn't really talk about it too much in the neuroscience chapter, but left and right are reversed in the brain. Right. So your right hand is controlled by your left hemisphere. Your right visual field is processed by your left hemisphere, etc. Uh, so everything's reversed and there's good reasons for that, but we won't go into those yet. So once it gets up into primary visual cortex in the back of the brain, then it heads up into those higher layers. One more thing that really helps you uh, understand that we do not see, our perception is not about what uh, is going on in our retinas. Um, in fact, because of the way these optical rays work, everything is upside down and backwards, okay? So you're not seeing uh, kind of that upside down backwards image of the world, you have the sense of the world being right side up. Um, and that's exactly the opposite of how it shows up on your retina. And so again, what we are seeing is how those uh, activations, those, those visual inputs correspond to what happens elsewhere in the world. So gravity, um, the rest of our body, right? Where are we in the world? That all helps us understand kind of what's up and what's down. Uh, so we, we orient based on all those other signals and put together a consistent image from all of those different signals. This is a fun click uh, link here about uh, why mirrors appear to flip the image horizontally, but not vertically. And it's sort of you might think about that in the context of this weird puzzle about the about the retina. This is very simple kind of optics uh, that's just kind of the rays crossing through the, the lens and therefore kind of flipping over. Um, it turns out for the mirror illusion, which I, I encourage you to watch, uh, it's just because you're kind of seeing essentially yourself from, from an opposite perspective. Um, and so uh, it's not actually flipping anything at all. It's kind of weird. You should watch the video. So now we're going to look at uh, more details about these transducers in the uh, retina, the rods and the cones. This diagram here shows you the distribution as a function of this very central part of your visual field called the fovea, where you have the highest concentration of cones. So cones are uh, the color selective uh, transducers. They have three different frequencies of light that they respond to. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. Um, and so your color vision is really concentrated in this very narrow kind of one or two degree band of very dense uh, uh, receptors for color uh, according to the, in the fovea. And then in the, outside of that, in what we call the periphery, the outer part of your visual field, you have more rods and those rods are 
just monochromatic. They have they detect a sort of bluish uh, overall tint uh, of color, and your whole visual field is quite wide, as you can see across the whole kind of area of visual angle. And the reason we're talking about visual angle here is because you know everything depends on how close or far away in terms of the absolute size, as we saw in the size constancy illusion. Um, so we talk about the angle. The angle is actually constant no matter how far away uh, or close up you're looking. And so we can understand essentially how high res our visual system is, the resolution of our visual system by essentially computing uh, how tightly packed those uh, cells are, the, the cones inside our fovea, and then uh, translating that into what kind of resolution we would be able to distinguish uh, at a kind of typical viewing distance. And in this case, we're looking at a distance of 10 inches, okay? And at that distance, you can resolve things down to about 300 dots per inch. And not coincidentally, that is the resolution of laser printers from the 80s. Uh, they, they kind of reached that level and said, oh, that looks like you can't really tell that it's a, uh, made up of dots. Um, and uh, similarly, more recently, uh, uh, LCD displays on phones, like the famous kind of Apple Retina display, actually do match the resolution of the Retina. And nowadays, they're actually slightly exceeding the resolution of the Retina, at which point you're kind of like, what's the point? If you're a camera buff, there's a bunch of other stuff about the focal length and the ISO and stuff. So you can actually think about your visual system in, in the same kinds of terms as you would a camera. One of the most important uh, features of the retina is that it actually is a very active processing system. So not only is it doing the raw transduction of light into electrical signals, it's then transforming those electrical signals, compressing the signal in critical ways. So that process of compression that takes place all the way throughout the visual system actually starts right there in the retina. And so you have these different layers of bipolar cells uh, that have different types of connectivity. Um, and one of the weird things about uh, the cones and the rods is that light actually inhibits them. They're always firing. Um, and when the light comes in, it actually turns them off instead of turning them on. And so you kind of have to flip the sign on everything. Uh, and the, the bottom line is there's this pattern of connectivity that produces what we call on center, where the neurons coming out of the retina and going up into the thalamus, what we call the retinal ganglion cells here at the bottom, um, that those are uh, detecting uh, a, a little region of bright light surrounded by dark light. Um, and then you have uh, similarly uh, the opposite case uh, also, where you have dark surrounded by light. The bottom line is that as we draw this kind of in these figures, um, there are uh, these kind of on-center, off-center receptive fields. And again, on-center means that if there's if it's brighter kind of in the middle of a little region of your retina that this neuron kind of responds to, compared to the outer surround region of that area, um, then the cell is going to be more excited. Um, and interestingly, if you shine a kind of uniform uh, amount of light across the entire, what we call the receptive field of that neuron, in other words, the whole part of the retina that activates or inhibits that retina, that ganglion cell, then um, in fact, they don't fire at all, okay? There's no change in firing. And this is the principle of contrast, as we've said many times, and the visual system is really, really sensitive to contrast. So here we can see that in fact, contrast, this sensitivity to differences is actually a critical element in compressing the visual scene. So everywhere in the visual scene where there's nothing changing, so a blank wall, uh, a, a blank screen, um, anything that just kind of consists of the blue sky, um, all of that, you're not actually seeing that much because those things get filtered out right in the retina uh, because there's no interesting kind of information uh, in, in anything that doesn't have any changes. And this is, again, the same principle of contrast. The contrast is all about tell me the news, tell me something different. And in the visual system, in the visual scene, where things change, that's where something's new or different. And so right there in the retina, it's already filtering out anything that's consistent and only focusing on places where you have changes in light, where something goes from being dark 
to light or dark or light to dark, etc. And so if you line up uh, some of these on-center, off-center kind of uh, cells in from the LGN into a particular kind of uh, line here, you get uh, what happens in primary visual cortex in V1, uh, known as the simple cells. These were discovered by Hubel and Weasel, and they got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Um, and they basically shined different stimuli uh, to uh, and recorded neurons in cats. Um, and they found that, in fact, these little kind of oriented edges of light and light and dark were actually what activated the neurons in this primary visual cortex area. Um, and this is how it works. You have essentially a, a kind of lineup of all the on-center parts so that essentially, you're in this case, you're getting more net excitation from the on-center. And then this darker part is not activating that surround as much. And so you get this kind of act, net activity. And so we can actually take these things and uh, represent them mathematically as something called the Gabor function. You don't need to know this, but this is just kind of uh, when you go on in vision and perception, uh, everybody talks about these V1 simple cells in terms of these Gabor functions, which are these kind of uh, little kind of on-off uh, contrast sensors. Um, and then there's more complex end stop and length sum cells uh, that kind of take the output of these simple cells and kind of combine them in different ways. So already in primary visual cortex V1, um, you get more and more compression, more and more uh, detection of important features building on this basic detector of these simple line features.